recording the oral history of Jim Fiesel, Headquarters Company, 23rd Tank Battalion, 12th Armored Division. And we're doing so at the 69th Annual Reunion of the 12th Armored Division, Omaha, Nebraska, on Saturday, July 25th of 2015. First, Jim, I want to thank you for agreeing to sit down with me. You're and, welcome. Good night. And what we're going to do is we're just going to start this off. Where were you when the war started, and how did you grow up? Where, where were you from? Well, okay, I, my first skirmish, I was in high school at the time, and, and I was setting pins at a bowling alley in my hometown city when the report of the bombs dropped on Pearl Harbor. Uh, at that moment, you see, I had a few more years of high school, and my head, dad, having been a Navy man in World War I, uh, well, at least, you know, a year or so after, my, some of my friends were volunteering, dropping school to volunteer. So my dad asked me to not do that. He said, I'll get you soon enough. I don't want you to leave till you have to. So uh, after that, uh, I did finish my high school in June of 43 and uh, in fact went to school to work at a steel mill in the local town. And uh, when uh, I got my friendly friends and neighbors letter, uh, the uh, folks at the steel mill said, well, we can get that destroyed. <laughs> And I said, I don't want you to. And uh, so I uh, was uh, inducted at Chicago. And uh, by January, I was in Fort Knox, Kentucky. And I took my basic three months of uh, training. Uh, at the end of that training, uh, that would have put me close to uh, the June date, or at least the planning for the invasion date. And I have to believe that many of my buddies were sent on over. <clears throat> at the moment of my doctor's inspection at that time, he heard something that in my chest that he didn't like and got me assigned to wheel vehicle school and stay back. Um, from there, I was finished that training and then went to Camp Chaffee for a little bit of field training and then off to the boat. Uh, didn't know anything about the 12th Armored at that time, but uh, on the boat, and I, I was out there amazed when I looked around and as far as I could see there was ships, destroyers and um, iron layers and not all kinds of things. So I knew it was in something big. <laughs> Arrived in uh, um, um, not sure, I think I arrived on the east coast of Britain. I think somehow they with all, all the action in the Gulf they basically avoided that and landed us on the east coast put us by train down to Southampton and on to LST across the, the channel, up across the muddy north uh, slopes. Uh, and I said, the only praise I had at that moment is you guys had pushed the German back off the coast. I uh, arrived with the uh, field headquarters of 23rd Tank Battalion on, uh, as I've established since I've been home, uh, 10th day of December 44. <clears throat> I think the official report probably shows that their battalion commander uh, Colonel Meigs? Meigs was uh, 
killed a day or so before that. Um, I was assigned immediately into the S3 officer, operations officer's tank. And of course that was kind of a rude introduction when they had to tell me we're still cleaning up from this uh, terrible event. Um, but uh, from that point uh, I sat out the first skirmish we had at, at uh, Herlesheim um, because the S3 officer was a Captain Comfort uh, who I thought the world and all. I'd gotten to know him for a few weeks uh, and uh, he had parked us, to the best of my knowledge, just north of the uh, woods, the famous woods, and walked into Herlesheim and there was enough information developing that we didn't have enough force or capability of going in. Um, and uh, it's a little vague to me. Um, I was not, of course, in what we call the conventional fighting troops being in the tank of the S3 officer. Also being young, <clears throat> I never asked him, what's our duty for today? <laughs> when I came back from the war, I said, you know, if I'd had half the brains I do today, I would not move without saying, all right, Captain, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> uh, because it developed to one of the other interesting points that the battalion commander often wanted that man not back in another tank, he wanted him with him. <clears throat> And we'd wind up as a four-man crew tagging along behind. This uh, become interesting in particular when we were ordered to move north to Trier. We had been commandeered, whatever it is, by General Patton. So uh, we were night marching to Trier. And although my assignment at that moment was assistant driver bow gunner, I would do the night driving to let the driver get some rest. And so in our process of moving north, uh, we were stopped at some road junction when I understand that MPs were doing the guide duty out there to keep us from being lost. And the sniper in the woods off to my left had apparently silhouetted me against that moon and pulled that trigger. And by the grace of God, I had heard the light tank rev his engine to move out. And I shifted my tank like this and the bullet went behind my neck. <clears throat> the tank behind me must have saw muzzle flash. And he ripped that forest with machine gun fire. And it's amusing because of moonlight night, everything had been quiet except all you could hear is engines sitting there idling, one pop of a rifle, a sudden burst of machine gun fire, and we moved off. We did just land at Trier on about the 17th of March and uh, lit out to our assignment to get the bridge. We had passed through Bergenfeld and Baumholder and uh, come around the hillside into what I've determined, determined later was a town named Baumholder. No, Bergenfeld. Lonsfeld. Sorry about mixing up all the names. You clean this up, maybe. <laughs> <clears throat> There was battalion commander's tank in front of me with both of the officers and just in front of him a light tank which I believe I can now report was Lieutenant Lee. Uh, that 88 sitting out in the field to our left fired one shell which 
zipped in front of our tank and then it just thudded into the embankment, obviously a nice armor piercing. That, and I've always said uh, he expected us to be moving and he had his gun aimed accordingly. Uh, so but the only smart thing you do in Sherman tanks is throw them in gear and hope you can outrun something. Uh, he hit us with the next shell, which has turned out to be an 88 high explosive, uh, which ripped all the, as I learned afterwards, ripped all the tread off the left side of our tank. But I yelled out, fellas, we can keep this tank as partial shelter from that gun and let's crawl back around this hill. And I was leading them on hands and knees, elbows and knees, and uh, I think we'd gathered by the time we finally had to surrender because, like I said, I was leading and all of a sudden there was a pair of black boots at my nose. And I looked up and there was a Tommy gun staring at me and he spoke very good English and said, Surrender Americans, you're my prisoners. I agreed with him. <laughs> and. Uh, so as he gathered up what I said is 10 to 12 of us and marched us into town and put us in one room of a little two-room schoolhouse and uh, uh, we spent the night there. They made some attempts to bring a truck up during the night to load us, uh, to take us along, but by that time our artillery, I believe, had decided to were plugged and they started to unload in front of us and so the Germans said I didn't hear it but they left. They just walked away. I did discover that in the wee hours I had quit hearing the chatter between a guard just inside the door and a guard just outside the door. And uh, Short while after that stopped, and I checked and said, "Bill, oh, there's no guard here." We heard a little bit of pop, pop, and small arms fire, and uh, I opened the door and said, "We're just old Americans in here." And and an infantryman walked up and he said, "Well, he said we've cleared the town from here. Get on back." On the way back, I discovered the battalion command tank sitting at the gate of the city with. Uh, a gouge by a Panzerfaust right on the front glacius. Uh, I'm glad that at that moment the driver, at least I didn't see him, was not still there because that flak from that Panzerfaust had killed him and it had wounded both of the officers in the turret. Uh, as I walked on my the next thing came up was my own tank, and at that moment discovered that a Panzerfaust had barreled deeply into the right final drive gear. And my position as bow gunner at that moment was, by the grace of God, inches away from penetrating my gut. Um, out of curiosity, I said, they had to have two piles of ammunition out there, and that loader just oscillated between them. And I verified that. It, he had used his AP, and he went to the high explosive or the next shell. Uh, in my count, and I had had this verified years later, there were something like a total of 13 of our tanks. The reports on this incident are, seem to be very meager, and I think just my thought out of politics because the two officers, in essence, have been lost. We lost probably another 10 individuals, uh, I'm guessing now, what the total count of deaths and injuries were. Um, but I was walking unscathed and uh, a replacement, uh, Herman Gerhardt replaced the 
J. Schrader, uh, who had been the S3 at that moment, uh, the ballot uh, commander, battalion commander, had been a Colonel Logan, I believe. And uh, by that time, some of our other forces had reached the area of Spire and had more skirmishes. And I think we had developed the fact that uh, both Spire's Bridge and Worms Bridges were blown. So we had some time until they laid the pontoon bridge at Worms. And so I did pon around the 25th of March, uh, I drove a repaired tank, now assigned it as driver of that tank. And uh, Lieutenant Gerhardt was my officer. Uh, the issues uh, in the next uh, 10 or 15 days are rather uneventful, but uh, our uh, fellow troops had uh, managed to catch the bridge at Dillingen across the Blue Danube, and, and I have crossed the Blue Danube and through uh, some of the area down there, and my timing is not well, but uh, the new officer had decided he would let a company of tanks lead him, and, and uh, so we were doing so, and he got the word that uh, they'd run into something. They couldn't really identify or explain, and he said, Jim, we got to get up there and look, see what this is. So we drove back past the column, and, and I got up there looking at this 15-foot tall fence and the word Dachau, and uh, the officer said, Jim, put this tank right through that gate. I did that and immediately become aware that I was in a concentration camp. To my right was literally a stack of broken bodies, mostly bone, stacked like cordwood. Looking straight forward to me, here come what I called one of them just skin and bones, trying to walk towards me. And I was as scared as he was. Or Anyhow, I said to myself, what am I going to do if he gets to me? And I would have probably made the mistake of grabbing some sea rice or something. Fortunately, he didn't have the energy to get there and had to just sit down and at that moment, the lieutenant who had dismounted came back and he said, let's get out of here. We got orders to keep chasing Germans. Uh, again, I think the publicity books said, uh, this is a field, little smidgen, of what often doesn't get reported officially because we weren't supposed to take Dachau. And, uh, but I was there. And I will testify to my dying day, to anybody who wants to believe it didn't happen, because this was the location of the gas chamber, the railroad tracks that brought them up there. And in fact, a witness to the wreck train set in there, which I was told later, full of something like 30,000 bodies. Uh, my next issue worth talking about, I suppose, is we went on down towards Berlin on the Autobahn, which is a new surprise to me to see this much highway, airplanes parked in the woods just off there, uh, which is much reported. Uh, all they had to do is roll them on that highway and take them off. And uh, poked her nose just into the West End, I guess it was, of Moscow, I mean, Munich. And I was sitting there, sort of lounging on the top of my tank by a hedgerow. And uh, suddenly I heard the crank off of a light 
aircraft and he rose just above that hedge and since I was practically leaning on the 50, I whirled it around the unidentified plane and I thought he ought to be back on the ground mm -hmm. and uh, put a couple of shells into the cowl of that airplane and my gun quit. A, uh, you might want to clean this out. The gunner had neglected it and the ammunition was only about six inch strip of 50 calibers. Uh, so I said, well, the Lord brought me back and maybe intended to bring that man back, but I rather think that I let one of the big boys get, off, get away. Uh, the uh, Pretty much the last part of my war, well, I lived to the end without any Purple Hearts. I had my nose just in Kufstein, Austria, when I got the word that the Germans had given up. I spent just a few days after that uh, guarding a relay half-track, radio half-track, because the little town they had pulled us back to uh, was kind of below the hill and couldn't get good radio communication. So we escorted them out on the hill to guard them, discovered that all we had to do is sit there and watch the young German folks enjoying a swim in their local pond. <laughs> And I, well, I'll finish up because I was put on a boat in, in the summer of 45 and didn't even understand until I was on the boat that I was headed for the Pacific Theater. But uh, Harry Truman gave me a birthday present on the 14th of August, the day before my birthday, when I turned 20. and. Uh, so we got the orders we could turn into Boston. Uh, spent uh, another year kicking around the Camp Grant in Chicago because they weren't free to let me go and uh, had me stay around till the next March. Um, I'm grateful for many things. I'm grateful to get back. I'm grateful to the Lord or whoever it was that managed that. But I'm also sort of proud that I had some eyewitnesses to significant events. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We'd like to ask you if there is one thing that you'd like to tell students, children of today from all of your experiences that you've learned, what one thing would you tell them? Well, uh, I'm tempted to say the one thing I would tell is to reassure them that these concentration camps, these death camps, were there, very intently were there. Um, because as I said, when I witnessed that area of Dachau, you can't deny it. Uh, if I would tell a second thing, I would say become involved with your nation's politics from the standpoint that too much politics is in there and, and not enough, I've lost the word, the men that formed our country were uh, dedicated. Uh, Patriotism, founding. They not only wanted to build a country, they were willing to sacrifice to build a country. And uh, I sacrificed some years of my life and, and jeopardized my life. And I can't knock it. I came through it healthy and, and alive. Uh, but we have to pay attention because the politicians and even the higher-ups in our military services, 
they're geared for wars. And that is not necessarily the way we need to guide the country all the time.